welcome everyone to our social responsibility primary interest section webinar. This is entitled Critical Theory and Critical Pedagogy Bridging the Gap. Just a quick reminder, if you are not speaking, if you can put yourselves on mute as we have 50 people in the Zoom room this the, the afternoon, this down. evening. The All right. The force is down. The force is down. Okay. Hey! So just a quick agenda for our talk today. We're going to have our introductions. We're going to do a brief setting the stage regarding how we can incorporate social justice in language teaching. We'll present our panelists and have them do their presentations and we will end with the Q&A discussion and closing. All right, so as we form this panel, uh, this is actually our primary intersection panel from Denver 2020 with the cooperation of the teacher education intersection and the applied linguistics section uh, intersection. In Atlanta 2019, our SRES academic session focused on talk to action. So we have a lot of theories, a lot of ideas on how we can incorporate social justice in language teaching, but how can we actually have solid action? And we had an incredible panel demonstrate this in Atlanta. And we wanted to, for our primary intersection, continue the conversation and include um, specific intersections with regard to how we can provide a space for intersectionality within the different ISs in social justice. And this also um, happily goes along with some of the recommendations from the amazing group, the Diverse Voices Task Force, which was appointed by TESOL back in October, uh, as uh, they had a principle of actively seeking out to include uh, non-white marginalized and underrepresented teachers and scholars and graduate students. And so this helps to provide a platform for this as we continue this mission of uh, inclusivity and equity. All right, so just a very quick question. We're only gonna spend about a minute. How do you or can you incorporate social justice in your language teaching? Just throw some ideas out there in the chat as we get started. What are some ideas that we're hearing or we're seeing? Raya? I think Sorry, I'm muted. So some of the things people are saying in the chat are building units around social justice themes, using service learning to engage learners in the community, diverse readings, educating our students and fellow teachers using community-based projects, uh, using not just diverse texts, but also diverse symbols. Um, more people are saying community engaged learning or service learning, inviting students to share their experiences with social just injustice, using action research projects and involving learners, um, focusing on stories and narratives that counter stereotypes, helping students learn how to advocate for themselves, highlighting the variety of Englishes spoken around the world, as well as the variety of folks who use English, um, sharing stories and examining place-based issues, um, focusing on asset-based teacher teaching and multilingualism. Um, so a lot of different themes we see recurring here, focusing on learners' experiences and stories, as well as ensuring that a diversity of perspectives are represented in our teaching. Excellent. Well, you are going to love this panel that we have for you today as they cover a lot of this. Very good. Thank you for the brainstorming today. All right. So uh, I want to go ahead and introduce our panel. Uh, the first speaker we have is Jenna cushing Libner. She, her, she is an assistant professor from the University of Wisconsin Whitewater, and she's developed the Heritage Language English uh, Heritage Language Education Program for practicing teachers, and she teaches at UWW's Bilingual Education ESL Program. She specializes in participatory design and action research as uh, she approaches the critically conscious language learner development. And her scholarship um, is shaped through theories of critical race, ethnic studies, settler colonialism, and racio-linguistics. 
Next panelist we have is Amin Devoti. He's a doctoral student, he, him. He's a doctoral student in ESL, technology and teacher education at Texas A&M University, current teacher trainer, and has had workshops in the US, Mexico, Armenia, and Iran. And his research interest includes sociopolitics of language learning, language identity, and educational technology. Our next panelist is Allison Yasukawa, she, her. She is an associate professor and director of English language learning at the California College of the Arts and interdisciplinary visual artist and ESP art and a design educator. She focuses on communicative overlaps between language learning and art and design learning framed from critical art education and language justice perspectives. And our final panelists are Laura Liu. She is an assistant professor in, Engl in English as a as a new language program coordinator in the Division of Education with Indiana Purdue University, Columbus. She integrates art-based approaches into her teaching and into her three primary research areas, globalization, diversity, sustaining pedagogies, and teacher, ed teacher ed educator, international professional development. Joining her is Sari Broadley, she, her, She's a, graduate she's a graduate of the teacher preparation program at Indiana University, Purdue University, Columbus, and she completed coursework to earn dual licensure in elementary education and teaching English as a new language. She has applied for and completed the IUPUC Office for Student Research Project and is a and with her faculty mentor, uh, Laura Liu. All right, these are our panelists. I am uh, one of your moderators today. I'm Anastasia Hawaja, she, her. I'm currently a senior instructor at Inch University of South Florida and I adjunct with humanities and English departments. I'm the past co-chair for uh, the TESOL Social Responsibility Intersection, past chair for the TESOL Palestinian Friends and Professional Learning Network, and currently part of the TESOL Membership Professional Council. My research engages with global peace education and breaking the binary understanding of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict through the exploration of language use and language representation. My co-moderator today is Raya Werner, she, her. She's a PhD student in language and literacies education at the Ontario Institute for Studies and Education at the University of Toronto. Her research focuses on teachers in the Cote d'Ivoire can use the arts to teach English. She has worked as an English teacher, teacher trainer in the Cote d'Ivoire, Tanzania, Ecuador, Thailand, and South Korea. She is also the past co-chair for TESOL Social Responsibility Intersection and is the founder and chair for the Arts and Creativity uh, PLN, Professional Learning Network. Thank you, panelists. This is going to be a wonderful panel, and our first speaker we're going to kick things off is Dr. Jenna Cushing Lubner, entitled with a talk entitled "I Don't See Myself Going Back Again: Threshold Concepts and Growing Critical Consciousness Among Pre-Service Teachers of Multilingual Youth." So I will stop sharing my screen and take it away. Thank you. Um... Very much. I will say, I uh, before I start, I had um, a little bit of a disaster yesterday, and my um, my I spilled a whole glass of water on my computer, and I lost my very beautiful slides and presentations. And I'm using a loaner right now, so um, I made up some slides that are very basic. So. Um, Hopefully they'll, <laughs> they'll be somewhat useful. Um, so I'm talking about this idea of threshold concepts and their role in growing critically conscious, critically conscious um, pre-service teachers who are preparing to teach multilingual youth through lenses of sustainable multilingualism, um, who are also um, recognizing the, the wide, wide range and dimensions and complexities of what it means to be a social justice and socially conscious, sociopolitically conscious educator. Um, there's an excellent book um, called, um, talking about bottlenecks in social justice teacher education um, by Paul Gorski and several other um, editors. And um, they talk about uh, the need for um, social justice teacher, teachers to be generalists in all of the intersecting complexities of our historical and present day social and political worlds. Um, and it asks a lot of teacher educators um, to know how to teach in these environments in order to prepare our, our future teachers, not only to um, be knowledgeable about, but to be um, capacitated to act. 
Um, and this is what um, the work that I've been doing for the last two years um, with pre-service teachers um, has been looking uh, more closely at. So just um, a quick kind of starting point, what we mean by threshold concepts and how it fits into thinking about um, socially, so, socio-political consciousness as disciplinary knowledge in our teacher preparation world of, for language teachers. So threshold concepts um, comes on the scene by um, Meyer and Land, um, and it's uh, about 15 years ago now. And they're talking about um, things that are not just discrete content, or discrete concepts that are specific to our fields. But um, threshold concepts are these large areas of conceptual knowledge. And one way to think about that is um, they talk about it in terms of a tunnel that you move through. But one of the ways that I talk about it with my pre-service teachers is to say it's kind of like when you're walking into a house, right? So you come from the outside and I grew up in the country. So when you were coming into the house, you were coming from the woods and you would walk through a doorway or through an entryway into uh, the house that I grew up in, in um, into a kitchen, right? And the, the, the physical environment, the social world of the woods and of the kitchen are two distinctly different um, places in all of their dimensions. And so when we think about threshold concepts, these are things that are specific to different disciplines. Every discipline has them that are um, spaces that you move through. You don't just pass through them, but they're spaces that you move through, you engage with them. And as you move through them, your perspectives on the discipline, your perspectives on how the world works through that disciplinary knowledge is irreversibly changed. So Meyer and Land talk about irreversible shift. Um, when we think about disciplinary um, threshold concepts in the world of language um, education, one of the examples that I give to my pre-service teachers um, was when I was learning Turkish for the first time. And Turkish is an agglutinatory language. Um, all the languages that I speak and had learned to that point were not agglutinatory languages. And so um, it was a huge struggle for me to wrap my mind and my my thinking, my conceptual thinking around not only glutination, but also vowel harmony and how that has meaning to communication. And uh, it was through through kind of like tapping into that threshold concept of um, Turkish language that I my my thinking had to actually change. And it was only once my thinking changed the way that I process language and process the world through that language that the language began to open up for me as a as a new learner of that language. But um, threshold concepts exi exist in all sorts of disciplines, um, and a lot of the work for threshold concepts comes out of disciplines like engineering and psychology. Um, more recently, it's been brought into teacher education, um, and one of the ways that it's been brought into teacher education is through this idea of difficult knowledge in our disciplines. Um, and one thing that I want us to think about is how the difficult knowledge is the knowledge that we wrestle with. It's the knowledge we grapple with, but as language teachers, educators that are attuned to socio-political realities and raising socio-political consciousness, um, this um, these threshold concepts are far beyond kind of the discrete thinking around language um, and and even things like socio-cultural dimensions of language. Um, where it's thinking about the, the way that language is housed within these larger and, and complex ecologies and shaped by the socio-political environment. Um, and so in, in one way that we can also think about this is um, through uh, the, the metaphor of a bottleneck. Um, and this is the book that I referenced earlier. Um, it's a really great um, resource book for teacher educators. Um, and it's talking about threshold concepts as, as being bottle, bottleneck spaces where our pre-service teachers and sometimes us as teacher educators and researchers of teacher education and, and teaching um, get caught in a bottleneck. And that bottleneck is our wrestling and grappling with these threshold concepts that are actually asking us to experience paradigm shift. And that paradigm shift um, aligns with what um, Kevin Kumashiro, Dr. Kevin Kumashiro talks about in terms of the crisis of learning. That when we learn a, about things that shift our paradigms, that sh require us to view the world through different lenses and perspectives, it actually puts us into a place of crisis um, because it's asking us to understand the world in a different way. 
And because of that crisis of learning, there are real emotional responses um, that come from trying to figure out where the ground is underneath our feet and how the world actually functions. I'm no longer in the woods. What is this world that I'm in that has this oven and the stove and these tables? What is this? What does it mean to be in this kitchen, for example? Um, so, oops, wrong direction, sorry. So um, one of the studies that I've done looking at threshold concepts um, is uh, uh, it's been it's a 18 month study and it's um, looking at pre service teachers in both an English as an additional language or second language teacher preparation program and a program that prepares bilingual and bicultural teachers. So these are pre service teachers in an undergraduate program and the the program itself is um, two thirds Euro origin white students um, who are English dominant and of those two thirds students um, about half of them are emergent bilinguals or, or confident bilinguals, mostly in Spanish um, and English and then a third of the program are Spanish English bilingual, Spanish dominant, um, um, Latin American or US Latinx Chicanx origin students. Um, and so what we're looking at in, in, this, in this work that, that I've been doing with pre-service teacher educators for the last um, two years is a question, uh, is this primary research question, what are the indicators provided by pre-service teachers that show they may be experiencing cognitive bottlenecks connected to socio-political consciousness and opportunities for paradigm shift. Um, as teacher educators, the key here is being able to recognize when our pre-service teachers are experiencing these crises of learning, the, the paradigm shifts that are being asked of them as they engage with socio-political um, consciousness that is really um, asking for an irreversible shift, an irreversible change in how they understand the world to work in order for them to enact a different way of being with multilingual children, particularly multilingual children of color and the families and communities who love and raise them up in the world. Um, particularly when they are teaching in and with um, learners and communities who are not specifically sharing the same backgrounds that they have, um, and when um, we are all have um, experienced um, the, the socializing um, and at times indoctrinizing, um, indoctrinating process of learning how to function in, so, uh, in settler colonial contexts, in context for racialization and racial capitalism are really um, primary forces that shape the way that we live and communicate and understand each other and our places in the world. So in this particular study, um, I was looking at 47 pre-service teachers. Um, they were a mix of um, Latin American, Latinx, Latino, Latina, and Latino um, identity, um, self-identifying, um, and white European origin pre-service teachers. Um, there was a mis mix of Spanish and English bilingualism, Korean and English bilingualism, and English dominance. Um, and um, these teachers, um, participated in, in um, weekly video reflections over 16 weeks. Um, and it was part of three different courses that were part of their pre-service teacher preparation program in ESL and bilingual bicultural education. Regardless of what their minor was, they were taking the courses together because they're folded in together. Um, and they did video reflections using Flipgrid. Um, so Flipgrid captures, um, captures um, video and audio and um, these were then transcribed. Um, they were transcribed for um, both audio, the, the, um, the verbal transcription and also they were transcribed for visual cues of emotional processing. Um, and so there were 45 hours of transcribed video reflections in total. Um, and what I want to do is focus on um, on two of the um, two of the pre-service teachers who are providing examples of how they are engaging with um, paradigm shift through these um, threshold concepts, how their emotional states are providing their teacher educators with indicators that they are engaging with um, threshold concepts that are requiring them to grapple with um, a changing perspective on how the world functions, how language functions, and what their positionality and roles are as increasingly socio-politically conscious um, teachers 
of multilingual youth of color. So I have um, two example here, examples here. Um, I'm gonna share an example from Tanya, who was an English dominant um, um, white pre-service teacher. She was a um, white woman from the Midwest Great Lakes region. And um, also Daniela, who was a Mexican origin, um, identified as Latina or Mexican American, um, Spanish English bilingual, Spanish dominant um, woman, who was also becoming a, a, a teacher in the same courses in the same programs. Um, the courses that they were taking were introduction to ESL and bilingual education, which was kind of a foundations course, and also a second language acquisition course. Now the content of these courses are pretty typical um, in the preparation programs for ESL and bilingual teachers. Um, across the board, many, many programs would have a second language acquisition course and sort of an introductory foundations course, but the content of these courses can vary drastically. So both of these courses, it's really important that both of these courses um, intentionally centered histories of, of the, of um, um, racial linguistic um, development and formation, understanding the role of schools and language um, in settler colonialism and forms of contact colonialism, um, and also was uh, had a focus on um, immigration history and the formation of, of, um, of immigrant multilingual communities and migrant multilingual communities um, through a xenophobic and nation, like xenophobic nation, settler colonial nation state um, lens. So it was, uh, the courses were intentionally focused on these socio-politically, um, 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 I would, uh, these clear socio-political um, structures and how they, how they shape um, language use and the teaching of different languages and learners taking up and, and learning of and using different languages and varieties of those languages. So um, Tanya um, was an example from the foundations course. So she was in the introduction to ESL and bilingual education course. And this was from one of her um, reflections that happened during the 10th um, the week of the course. And during this time, she had um, just completed an observation in a school building. And so she had been spending time in a school building that had many multilingual children of color in the building. Um, and she was referencing the readings from that week and then she also began to tie in her experiences in this school building. The goal of the readings for the weeks leading up to this had been to focus on um, the, the idea of myths of inclusion, how marginalization and centering occurs through the normalization of different languages and the vi invisibility and in making it visible of different languages and speech communities. Um, and she also starts to bring together um, discourses and narratives that that are occurring in the larger socio-political environment at that time. So um, in this excerpt, um, she says, this is the clearest I think I've seen anything before. I'd been to this school so many times before, and it was like I was walking into a new place, like I'd never seen it before. I think before I would have said this is a school where any kid could feel welcome. They have these multicolored handprints and the kids' paintings of rainbows, and this is who I am, and all of that. But now it's like, bam, English, bam, more English. The books are all in English. The walls are all in English. The announcements are all in English. You wouldn't know there are kids who speak Spanish in the, in the place, except they put the rules out in Spanish real big. Like, oh, by the way, you better behave. There's no excuse. And you say you didn't know because this, we'll make sure, is in Spanish. Right where you can see it, makes sense. It's basically like the elementary version of you're all just rapists and drug dealers. Nobody's sending their best. I'm sure some of you are good people. So in this- You have one minute? Okay. Sorry. <laughs> yep, that's fine. So in this excerpt, what you're seeing from Tanya, you're hearing from Tanya is a way that she's grappling with this idea of irreversible shift. She's beginning to see the world through this tunnel of threshold, con of this thresh these threshold concepts in ways that force her to see the world through a different lens that she cannot go back again. She said she's seeing it the clearest she's ever seen before. She won't be able to see it the way she had seen it before ever again. So I'm just going to, um, 
go to the, the primary piece here, which is for all of us to think about how our course objectives can be transformed to, from thinking about course objectives to thinking about threshold concept environments that we're producing and forming for our teacher candidates to engage in meaningful and insistent ways with sociopolitical realities that shape the world of language learners who, um, and the schools where they are being positioned as English language educators and the role that English has played particularly in the lives of, of um, communities of speakers who they are teaching and working with. Um, so this, this, this pushes us to think pedagogically for how to teach threshold concepts related to social justice, um, how, what the pedagogical content knowledge of that is and how to read emotional expressions as indicators for our pedagogical content moves. And recognizing the threshold concept engagement can, can be uh, expressed in multiple ways. Um, and that threshold concept engagement can look like um, interaction. It can look like wrestling and grappling. It can look like retreat because of that crisis that it places uh, um, people into. Um, it can look like emergence that may actually seem very basic um, because um, it's beyond the sort of like discrete content understanding, but it's the, the internalization may express itself in sort of basic ways, but that is the emergence process and also can have multiple entry and movement points by people across our spaces. So it pushes us to think in different ways about how to differentiate for, the, for our intentional instruction around the formation of sociopolitical consciousness. All right, thank you so much for that presentation, Dr. Christian Lubner. Next is going to be Amin Devuri, and he has a presentation entitled The Role of English Language Teaching in Promoting Social Equity, a Case of Post-War Iraq. Can I share my screen now? You see my screen? Okay, perfect. So hello everyone, thank you so much for joining this panel. I'm really excited to talk about uh, the role of English language teaching in promoting social equity, a case of post-war Iraq. So I'm gonna give you a very uh, brief introduction about the context of my study. So this is the Middle East. You can see Iraq, uh, which is uh, next to Iraq. I mean, I think you're frozen. I think his screen is frozen. It's okay, just give him a minute. I mean, can you hear? I mean, okay. Hmm. All right. Since we can't hear Amin, should we skip us head to Allison and go back to Amin when he comes back? Uh, yes, I was. Yes, I was going to suggest that. Let's let's go ahead and go. Are Allison, you are you ready there? for that, Allison? Yep, I'm good. All right. So um, when Amin comes back, we will come back to him. Our um, our next panelist is going to be Allison Yasukawa, who is going to be presenting on global contemporary art as critical pedagogy for English language teaching. All right. All right. Um. Okay, so thank you everybody. Um, I'm so excited that you're here and that I'm here and that we're all together um, in this uh, Zoom world. Um, so yes, yeah, so I'm gonna be talking about um, contemporary art, uh, particularly global contemporary art um, um, and its um, kind of capacity um, to promote critical pedagogy in English language teaching. Um, So I actually like to start with a little bit of input from you all. Um, in the chat, would you mind writing a word or words that you um, would use to describe art?
expressive, reflective, inspiring, creative, visual, thought provoking, personal. Wow, these are fast. <laughs> uh, evocative, emotion, awesome. A way of self expression, slow and fast. Transformative, feelings, a lens, aesthetic, beauty, innovation, provocative, performative, documentary, transcendence, life. All right, next question. Um, in the chat, please write a word or words that you would use to describe contemporary art. Weird, reflective, dystopian, cool, powerful, evocative, abstract, happening now, mumbo jumbo, confusing, modern, undeserved bad reputation, interesting, personal, political, world around us, makes me pause, confusing. Great. No pattern at all. Yes. So I think that your, um, thank you so much, your um, kind of quick responses, I think are, are um, kind of representative of, I would say the way that people think about art in general, and then the, the um, kind of potential challenge that contemporary art can pose or that can um, complicate people's ideas of art. Um, so I want to talk specifically um, about that today. Um, and I'm also, I'm an um, English language teacher, I'm also an artist, um, and I work um, really at the intersection of these two fields um, in art and design schools. So I do um, ESP teaching um, for uh, multilingual students who are coming to art and design school to become uh, artists and designers. Um, so I get to work uh, in studio classes um, and do language instruction in the context of uh, visual art production. Um, so, but what does it mean for in a, in a more kind of standardized TESOL context? Um, a lot of people have a lot of anxiety about art, particularly art teaching. Um, and think, well, I'm not an artist. So how could I, how could I even begin to do this? Or they might think, also, I teach English, not art, so why should I even bother? Um, and I would say that there are two main reasons um, kind of why art um, is, a, is a productive tool uh, for the language classroom. Um, the first is that art and language have a productive communicative overlap. Um, when we think about um, language and about art, they really um, prioritize being able to communicate ideas. So I think for me, that's sort of the, the foundation of um, the relationship that I think of between these two fields. Um, and also that artistic practice offers both process and content resources to engage in critical pedagogy. And this is also the reason that I bring in contemporary practice um, because when I think about what artists do, um, I think about their ability to observe, record, and communicate what they see, feel, and experience in the world around them, um, that they represent a historically, socially, and culturally situated time and space, and that artists often question or even challenge um, status quo. So when we're thinking about um, how can we engage in um, socially just instruction, I think the arts can be a lens into um, addressing a lot of this content. The other thing about um, a contemporary practice is that there are um, particular kinds of um, um, habits or tendencies that contemporary artists use in their practice. So when I'm talking about contemporary art, I'm just, I'm just talking about artists who are alive now, who are making work now. Um, and a lot of, there's been a lot of research um, on both contemporary practice and also its role um, 
as sort of an educational tool um, in an arts integration context, meaning bringing arts into um, non-arts fields. Um, so sort of using arts to um, enhance uh, content from, from um, uh, other kinds of learning environments. Um, so thinking about um, what, can, what contemporary artists do um, also asks us to think about what are our expectations about what art is. And also about what kind of art we usually see in English language teaching. So this, I just did like a quick uh, Google search for um, ESL and art. Um, and this is like a kind of pretty typical, I think, sort of example of the kind of, um, that are sort of out there circulating on the internet. Um, so let your students meet Van Gogh, Monet, and others in these brilliant, in these eight brilliant art activities. Um, so, you know, Google search is going to give you a certain amount of things. Um, so we've got Van Gogh's Starry Night, we've got Monet's Water Lilies. Um, and this, this is actually, um, this is a, um, a textbook from that was produced by the um, Ministry of Education in Tunisia. So resources like this, um, we may sort of associate with um, a Western context, but they can they can exist beyond beyond only a Western context. Um, so in this uh, lesson, they were going to an art show at the National Gallery in London. Um, and they're, you know, they're doing some reading, they're doing a reading and speaking activity, um, looking at different things that are happening in the museum. Um, so if we think about what kind of work is represented in the National Gallery, this is, um, this is one of the rooms in the National Gallery. Um, and this is, the, this is the, the homepage for the National Gallery. So we have um, the story of European art um, masterpiece by masterpiece. So if we think about a masterpiece, um, we might want to ask, um, what are the artistic masterpieces that we um, seem to know? Who made them and, and who has mastery in the arts? So again, if we look at this particular room from the National Gallery, we've got Camille Pizarro, we've got uh, Cezanne and another Cezanne. So if we if we look at the both of these examples together, we've got Van Gogh, Monet, Cezanne, and Pizarro. So we've got a Dutch artist, a French artist, uh, a, two French artists, and a Danish French artist um, who were all working between um, like the mid 1800s to the early 1900s. So again, if we're thinking about um, what are the artistic masterpieces and who made them, who has mastery in the arts, um, then we might ask if artistic mastery is only or primarily people like this, who are dead, white, male, and Western, what is it that, they're, that we're missing in our potential to engage the arts as a way to think about the, the kind of socially situated context in which we find ourselves in and the questions that we can ask about um, different representations that, that are happening um, in our classroom and then in the world at large. Also, if we think that art is only or primarily about skill or craft, beauty, specific materials and, tra and traditions, um, then we may be unintentionally reinforcing limited narratives about what art is and who artists can be. So again, if we think about um, what artists do, observe, record, and communicate the world around them, represent a historically, socially, culturally situated time and space, and question and even challenge the way things are, um, if, the, if, if we're looking at the Impressionists and post-Impressionists from Europe, we're not getting a sort of a full picture of um, artists who are doing this kind of work. 
right? So if we if we expand the canon beyond um, these the artists that are traditionally um, used as examples, we have a lot more potential to um, to broaden what who and what we're talking about, where they're making work, and what kind of work they're making. So. The other thing that we can do is we can expand the ideas of what art is and how it can be made. So this is um, a very kind of simple practice that you could do in the class. You don't need any specific materials. You don't need any specific skill sets. Um, so as a team, you choose five to 10 items that you brought with you. They could be things in your purse, your backpack, your bag, your pockets, and those are going to be your materials, your art making materials. So students have one minute then and they need to use these materials to make a sculpture collectively. So in this, this uh, group, they had some pens, a water bottle, paper, and a notebook. Um, so students they, they all work together in teams to make these one minute sculptures. Um, and then we go around the room and do observations. So I ask them what they noticed about these in general. And then I can ask them specific things about what do you notice about how big they are? What do you notice about where they are? What do you notice about how the objects are in relationship to one another? And then we can do another round. So, and then next round, um, I might introduce another prompt to say, make it bigger, right? So you have to use the same materials, same group of students, and then they have to make it bigger in some way, right? So now we've gone from something that's very kind of tight and together to something that's a little bit more expanded. You can do another round of observation, um, checking in again about size, about position, about materials, about location. Um, and then we might come up with uh, second directive, change the object's relationship to one another. So here again, they would work together and do one more round. Um, and again, they're kind of expanding and creating um, sort of new relationships and new positions uh, with these same materials. So again, this is, you don't need any specific skill, you don't need any specific materials, um, but in this process, uh, students are able to kind of get out of a traditional um, uh, kind of at their desk classroom setting and engage in a different way um, in the classroom. So if you think about an activity like this um, in the chat, um, please write a word or word to describe what students would need to accomplish a task like this. Prepositions, they need to work with each other. Anything else that they would need? Adjectives, invention, imperatives, face-to-face -face learning, innovation, creativity, collaboration, vocabulary, modeling, safety, teamwork, agreeing, disagreeing, negotiation language. Negotiation, collaboration, group work, engagement. Great. Yes. So um, this the the activity um, an activity like this kind of naturally um, sets up a communicative environment where students have to negotiate working with each other and working with these materials to um, engage with the activity. So they're building these kinds of relationships between um, their language practice and their art making um, that are drawing on problem solving, creative production, risk taking, also communication, meaning making, and interaction with interlocutors. So if we're thinking about kind of places in a lesson where this could come in, you know, if you're, if you're looking at even a very introductory class, um, right away, one of the things that you are often talking about are classroom objects, right? So these would be, again, the kind of objects that would be um, sort of around you, on you, on your person, in your bag, um, so that so you can introduce vocabulary, as somebody said. Um, 
vortex come? Oh. But then it could also be extended to um, more advanced kinds of um, more advanced levels. So at an intermediate level, you might bring in comparative and superlative additives. You might bring in other kind of language functions that somebody else suggested in the chat. Um, and in an advanced context, you could talk about um, what does it mean uh, that we surround ourselves with these objects every day? And how did these objects affect our sense of self? Um, so I, um, I got my one minute warning. So what I wanna do is um, I wanna add into the chat, um, people may have questions about, well, where do I find art that can you know, serve as examples like this? Um, so I have a Google Doc that has a lot of different resources um, about different um, contemporary art, um, different contemporary artists, and also that have a lot of um, teaching materials. So videos um, and also studio visits, interviews with artists, um, where you can expand the, the kind of canon of your work beyond um, more traditional expected um, uh, work with um, the Impressionists or other artists. Um, and I also, uh, should I put my, I know we're doing questions and so should I put my question up now or do you want me to save it? Uh, you can put it up and then we can go back to it after, um, all the presenters have presented. Okay. Let me see if I can all get right. Um, oops. All right. Okay. So you could put the question in the chat. Okay. Allison, thank you so much. And Amin is back. So okay. we're going to welcome back Amin. And Amin is once again presenting on get my own, there we go. The role of English language teaching in promoting social equity, a case of post-war Iraq. Hi everyone. I'm so sorry that I got disconnected. I just moved into this house yesterday, so I don't have Wi-Fi. I was using my cell phone as a hotspot. That's why I got disconnected. So now I'm talking with you on my phone and I'm going to do something really weird. So I'm going to use the rear camera to show you the slides on my laptop in it, if you don't mind. So I don't, it's not going to be perfect, but it's better than nothing. So uh, this is the title of my presentation, the role of English language teaching in promoting uh, social equity, the case of post-war Iraq. And I was talking about the context of my study, the location and the uh, population of Kurdish people and Kurdish people are believed to be the largest uh, ethnic group without an independent country and they live in Iraq, in Turkey, in Iran and Syria. So uh, today's focus is on how different wars and conflicts in that region affected bilingual education and social justice for Kurdish people. Uh, in one of the cases, there was a war between Iran and Iraq uh, during the 80s, which lasted for eight years and more than 500,000 people were killed and 500,000 people were injured. And this is a very special war for the Kurdish people in Iraq because uh, the former dictator of Iraq, Saddam Hussein, believed that Kurdish people in Iraq were kind of assisting the Iranian government. So it was, so they were basically uh, being attacked by their own government and that uh, Halabja chemical attack actually happened in 1988 which killed about 7,000 people, Kurdish people and this affected the first wave of immigration for, for Kurdish people in Iraq to Europe and the US and the phase two was when the Iraq-Kuwait war happened in 1990 and that led to a kind of a financial crisis and also educational crisis and the decline of public education, especially for Kurdish people. So that was the second wave of immigration. And uh, it was so bad that the, I, uh, you can see a quote here, it was so bad that the salaries for teachers dropped to $6 a month and families' resources were really limited. So they were not able to fund their kids to go to school. So they decided, many families, many Kurdish families decided just to send their, uh, you know, their boys to a school, not their girls. So that also led to uh, another crisis. And a lot of girls from that generation, Kurdish girls, they were deprived from the right of going to school and to receiving education. So, all these wars kind of acted as as a 
hidden enemy against the education of Kurdish people, especially after the Persian Gulf War, a large number of Kurdish children suffered from uh, post-traumatic stress disorder and weren't able to go to school. And also, as I said, many Kurdish families uh, became so poor and they were, uh, actually they had no choice to leave Iraq. So the, the third phase of immigration started uh, because of the U.S.-Iraq war that killed about 110,000 people. And the phase four of immigration for Kurdish people happened because of the ISIS uh, crisis that killed about 26,000 people. So if we want to also focus on the education in Iraq in general, it can be divided into four different periods of time. And today's focus is on the last one, which is post-US-Iraq war. Uh, in the first uh, three periods, just very quickly, Kurdish people didn't have the right to educate in their heritage language in, in Kurdish. Although in some uh, decades, the constitution of Iraq recognized Kurdish as a language, but they were never given a chance to practice it. But after the US-Iraq war, the new uh, constitution actually uh, gave the right to Kurdish people to study uh, and educate in their heritage language. And that was very important because a lot of dual language bilingual education programs emerged with a proclivity towards one-way immersion with Western curriculum in Kurdistan region of Iraq, meaning that the two languages used in the schools are Kurdish and uh, English. So that's the setting of my, uh, my study, dual language bilingual education programs in Kurdistan region of Iraq. And in these schools, these are international schools, most of them are American and British, and they claim that uh, through adopting Western curricula, uh, they are able to provide the same opportunities for Kurdish people that they usually provide for American and British uh, kids in, in England and, uh, and the US. So I, have two I had two research questions. How do dual language bilingual education programs in the Kurdistan region of Iraq promote equity for minority Kurdish children? And how do one-way language immersion programs affect the attitudes of Kurdish minority children towards their heritage, language, and culture? So the data was collected actually uh, through 120 written reflections by 40 students describing their attitudes towards English language and culture in three periods of time. I also conducted uh, semi-structured interviews with 12 teachers and five administrators. And I also critically reviewed the national bilingual policies uh, and the school's curricula. So the analysis uh, for the student reflection was a thematic analysis. For the interviews, I tried to use a narrative lens and use narrative inquiry. And I tried to uh, use critical analysis for analyzing the policy documents. So I'm going to show you a quote, one of the important ones from a secondary teacher in the dual language bilingual education school in Kurdistan region of Iraq, uh, in which he, he was explaining that uh, he met the mother of one of his former students and the mom was so happy because her son learned English and that opened a lot of doors for him and now he's financially you know independent and he's even helping his family but the only concern that that mom had was the fact that his son stopped calling him mom in Kurdish and uses the English term for that. So this quote is very important because it kind of shows what's going on from different perspective, how successful and important these dual language bilingual program can be in providing social equity and justice for Kurdish minority children. And also at the same time, the adaptation of Western curriculum without localizing it and how it can affect the uh, the heritage language and how these kids practice their heritage language. So based on the interview, some of the findings of my study were teachers and school leaders who really believe that dual language and bilingual education programs provide social equity for minority children. And they actually back their claims uh, by saying that they have higher rate of university acceptance rate and higher employment rate. And also local teachers who are teaching in the same schools, but they come from Kurdish backgrounds, uh, they also said that these programs provide a lot of opportunity, but they also shared their concerns about the reluctance of those kids toward uh, their heritage language and culture. And also international teachers uh, showed 
the same uh, concern. I remember I was talking with one of the teachers who is American teaching in the uh, Kurdistan region of Iraq, and he was saying that he became interested in Kurdish music, and one day he was asking his students about Kurdish music, and all of them were surprised and said, you are American, why do you listen to Kurdish music? Because we are Kurdish and we don't want to listen to it, so how come that as an American you are listening to this music? So that shows kind of their uh, attitude towards their heritage culture. And the student reflections, I'm gonna uh, ignore the quantitative data, so uh, showed that actually Kurdish children believe that Kurdish in a way harms their English accent, so it shows that they are kind of moving towards making English as their own, you know, first language. And also English culture, kind of American and British culture, uh, seems to be more prestigious uh, than Kurdish culture. That's the opinion of those kids. And also Kurdish events are kind of boring. I can guarantee you that they are not boring because I also come from a Kurdish background. So <laughs> I can say that for sure, that's not true. And the bilingual education policies, uh, this is really interesting because the heritage language right in Iraq is very clear and all the caveats and how schools can teach these heritage languages, they're clear. But the problem is the type of bilingual education and how these international schools can adopt Western curricula is, is not clear. It's really unclear. And that's why they, they have been able to kind of adopt these curricula without uh, localizing them. So, uh, so I'm also going to talk very quickly about cultural cringe because I know when I got disconnected that wasted a couple of minutes. So cultural cringe is tightly connected with cultural alienation, the process of devaluing or abandoning one's own culture or cultural background. A person who is culturally alienated places little value on their own or host culture and instead hungers for that of a sometimes imposed colonizing nation. This is a quote by Kurdish in uh, 2016, which I think is the case in Kurdistan region of Iraq, because I talked with many of those teachers and many of those kids, and I also went over the written reflections. So I can say that as a result of being overexposed to, to the target culture, this cultural cringe process started in, you know, in most of those schools. And unfortunately, those kids even began to dislike their heritage language and culture. But at the same time, we need to look at the, the issue from all different perspectives. I will, as I was saying, these international schools, these bilingual programs definitely helped Kurdish minority children in terms of social equity and justice, because now they can get better jobs, higher paid positions, and they can apply for uh, universities overseas because they learn both Kurdish and English at the same time. So, uh, yeah, this is a good quantitative data in a way. 70% increase in admission to European and American colleges happened over five years because of these bilingual education uh, programs in those international schools, as well as 65% increase in finding jobs in terms of uh, working in international companies. So, yeah, that was the end of my presentation. I didn't want to go over, so. This is the end of All my right. I mean, thank you so much. And thanks for that quick thinking of sharing your laptop screen from your phone. Wonderful. I'm going to get some technology program. So if I cannot figure out how to do it, I'm done. <laughs> Good point. All right. Thank you so much. Our final speakers are going to be Dr. Laura Liu and Sarah, uh, Sari Broadley who will be sharing a presentation entitled Sharing Funds of Knowledge, Autobiographical Explorations. You might be muted. Let me see. Okay. Oh, oh there you are. So um, thank you so much. So Sari is a recent graduate of our teacher education program at IUPUC. And we work together on a, um, we worked together on a student research project following a line of work that I've been looking at um, for some time across my courses, looking at funds of knowledge, specifically autobiographical explorations. Um, our question to talk about at the end of the presentation, how can teachers learn more about the funds of knowledge of their students and integrate these into curricula instruction? 
sub questions, how might reflecting on their own funds of knowledge enhance teacher appreciation for students funds of knowledge and how does this work benefit all learners in class. Um, in this presentation, we're going to describe an autobiographical assignment, inviting elementary ENL teacher candidates to share their own funds of knowledge through a digital story and explore a series journey in connecting this work to integrating students' funds of knowledge as part of meeting TESOL Standard 2, um, the new 2018 TESOL standards <clears throat> supporting ELLs in their socio-cultural context. Um, the funds of knowledge story assignment aim to support self reflection for e in, as ELL teachers, TESOL 2E. Um, and for Sari, this work guided her development of a unit plan outline to engage elementary ELs in reflection on their funds of knowledge to share in class, TESOL 2D. Um, and ultimately, this assignment sought to cultivate greater ability to appreciate and support ELs in their unique socio-political context in schools and beyond TESOL 2A. Um, you can find these online if you're not familiar with them, TESOL standard 2E. Candidates identify and describe the impact of their identity, role, cultural understandings, biases um, on their interpretation of ELs educational strengths and needs. 2D, that candidates implement methods to learn about personal characteristics of ELs and their families. 2A, that candidates demonstrate knowledge of um, how dynamic academic, personal, familiar, cultural, social context, and social political factors impact the education of ELs. We worked um, with Luis Moles' um, work on funds of knowledge to conceptualize this term. Um, he's first cited as using this term in 1992. Um, this body of work encouraged innovative teaching that draws upon the knowledge and skills of local households and aims to portray the complex functions of households within their socio-cultural context to replace false narratives. Um, we looked at some studies about that demonstrated the need to integrate funds of knowledge into school curricula. Um, another study in 1992 found that public schools do not acknowledge the strategic and cultural resources or the funds of knowledge of US Mexican ELs in the classroom that they brought from their home environments and that constructive relationships among students, teachers and parents were needed. Um, more recently, 2015, preparing educators to practice humanizing pedagogies that draw on ELs politicized funds of knowledge can support students and developing critical thinking literacy skills and see themselves as participants in the process of social equity. Another more recent study um, found the funds of knowledge of five families presented counter evidence to deficit narratives about my minority Yale populations. And then we looked at some studies demonstrating model pedagogies for how to do this work. Um, in 2005, we looked at a study from 2005, teachers visiting families to establish relationships. These home visits contrasted with homeschool communication focused on reporting problems or just a one-way flow from the school to the home. However, we found um, this to be very difficult to initiate for teacher candidates, new teachers. Um, a lot of times schools and districts will be hesitant to do this kind of practice. Um, and as a new teacher um, and a teacher candidate, this, this was difficult. So we found some other work. Um, 2018, Alvarez uh, bilingual first grade students wrote and drew pictures each month as a window into their understandings of their life experiences. Um, these products revealed self perceptions as being contributors to their family well being. Um, 2006, bilingual fourth grade students in a biliteracy classroom wrote and translated stories about their families in Spanish and English modeling the value of biliteracy. Um, so drawing upon this body of work, um, our teacher candidates after studying these, uh, this concept um, initiated creating their own funds of knowledge digital story to share with the class. Um, it, they completed an autobiographical assignment in my course introduction to bilingual education. They interviewed a family member or community community member about their own funds of knowledge and developed a digital story to share. Um, and this was inspired by some research showing that by reflecting on their own funds of knowledge, candidates were prepared more effectively to appreciate the funds of knowledge of their EL students. Um, so after completing this assignment, 
Um, Sari developed a family recipe unit, um, a unit plan outline for engaging Yales and exploring their own funds of knowledge. Um, this involved inviting the EL students in her student teaching placement to interview a family or community member to learn about the ingredients, nutritional benefits, and historical traditions of a family recipe. And I'm going to let Sari now describe um, this assignment in a bit more detail and um, her reflections on completing this assignment. So I was inspired to do this because I was a student teacher at the time and I did not get to know my students before we went into the COVID shutdown in the United States and students had to learn from home. And it was a way for me to get to know them and recognize um, and encourage them to have some positive experiences with their family. So the first stage of the unit involves describing one's own family recipe, including its ingredients, nutritional and and traditional value for the teacher. In the second stage of the unit, ELL students work with their family or community members to develop written descriptions for their own family recipes, ingredients, procedures, as well as nutritional and traditional values. Mixed English language ability groups peer edit one another's description. So they would get together in mixed groups. Um, in the third stage of the unit plan, the recipes are compiled into a class recipe book to be shared with their families and community members. Uh, there was a lot of, in our elementary schools, the sixth graders graduate and it was a way for them to bring, you know, to have something of all their students at the end to bring with them as they go on to middle school. So in the class with Dr. Liu, um, she encouraged us to write a book about a cultural aspect we experienced growing up. I chose Being a Good Jewish Girl. I borrowed the title from my friend who has a website called Being a Good Indian Girl and about developing appreciation for our own cultural heritage. And this, um, brought to light for me how, although in school as a child, I was given the time to celebrate my heritage, go to, um, you know, even though school was going on, I had to take days off to go to synagogue and practice traditions uh, and just miss school, but nobody ever asked me about it. So now I have a sensitivity to validate other people's um, practices that might be at home that the school doesn't do as a whole in my classes in the United States. Uh, Canada, so um, for this, um, for 2D, this unit plan invited my ELL students to share a favorite family recipe. This involved exploring the nutritional and, and traditional based value of a recipe by talking with their family members this assignment helps me as a teacher to understand their cultural traits of my ELLs by providing a window into how food is experienced and valued in their family's home. Um, in, the, in the TESOL standard 2A, the word dynamic stood out in me to me because this word reminds the teacher that effective instruction is dynamic and that it is always adapting to students' needs. Teachers validate the uniqueness of students when lessons acknowledge and utilize the present conditions that students are experiencing. For example, during the outbreak of COVID-19, my ELL students were at home taking my class online. So for meeting TESOL 2A, I designed a unit plan turning the difficult situation into a strength. I invited my ELLs to share a family recipe including the nutritional benefits and the tradition-based values. Some students may be taking on leadership roles in their homes, helping to cook. Um, during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, the, to minimize job-related stress on ELL parents, this unit plan supports students in this role and capitalizes on the situation by teaching grade level content and English language skills related to measurement Nutrition for Science and Writing for ELA. So 
So in summary, this assignment sought to enhance teacher candidate understanding and appreciation of ELL student multicultural, multilingual, sociopolitical realities by first reflecting on their own funds of knowledge and thereby engage better all students' funds of knowledge in the classroom and support ELLs amidst daily sociopolitical challenges, complexities with greater understanding and efficacy. And that's the end of our presentation. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Liu, and sorry for that. It was really great to see a student talk about a really fantastic project and seeing that come to life. Okay, we are going to move on to our discussion and our Q&A, and each of our presenters have um, questions that they would like to focus on. And do you, want, do you want me to? Yeah, if you could share the screen, Anastasia. I can do that. Yeah, so we've asked each of the presenters to uh, share a reflection question to sort of get the discussion started. Uh, so Jenna's question was, how does the engagement and avoidance of threshold concepts connected to socio-political consciousness shape the language teacher preparation and professional development settings you are involved with? either as a facilitator, participant, or researcher. Then Allison's question, which is number three on this list, is how might you or how do you use contemporary art in your classroom to engage in critical pedagogy? A means question, which is listed here as number two, is how can international schools adapt Western, Western curriculum to meet the local needs of bilingual children. And last, we have Laura and Sari's question, how can teachers learn more about the funds of knowledge of their students and integrate this into curricula and instruction? So we'd like to sort of take this as an opportunity to reflect on these four presentations. The theme of this webinar is around uh, connecting critical theory to critical pedagogy and uh, getting more of this sense of criticality into our practices. So we have sort of two options in this discussion. Either you can respond to one of these discussion questions or something else that resonated in one of the presentations for you, or you can take this as an opportunity to ask a question to one of our presenters. So you can either respond or ask a question. So uh, you have the option to unmute yourself if you'd like to um, speak. There's also a raising your hand button if you'd like to speak next. Or if you prefer, you can type your question or response into the chat box and we can read it aloud if that's more comfortable for you. So does anyone have any thoughts or responses to start off our discussion here? Um, I've also put the questions in the chat box if it's easier for you to see them there. Yeah, I was Any just thoughts sure or that, questions? You know, this is um, Ray Farrelly. I'm in Colorado. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Um, I'm not video worthy. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so okay. I just wanted to share an idea. I wrote a little bit about it. It's based on a colleague, Jill Watson, in Minnesota, who does a lot about leveraging heritage language use in the classroom. And she was noting, this is to question number four, um, a lot of folk tales and fairy tales and stories kind of span a lot of cultures and countries. And so she looked at um, Hansel and Gretel, which has a similar version in Somali. And her suggestion was bringing in a Somali elder 
to tell the story in Somali. And prior to and after, they would do some kind of comparison of the Somali version and the German, I think Hansel and Gretel is based in Germany, <laughs> the German version, and then of course, the English version that they would be reading and looking for themes and just making connections to their own culture and these other cultures. And, and just having the kids see their languages and their elder involved in the curriculum really kind of honored their funds of knowledge. That's great. Thanks for sharing that, Ray. Any other thoughts or questions sparked by these panelists? Anything our panelists would like to add to possibly provoke further discussion? I just wanted to say I really appreciated all of the presentations so much and their connection and have learned from each one of them. And I, I really like this idea of engagement or avoidance of threshold concepts and thinking about um, how to help my candidates walk through and connect with that TESOL, it's TESOL 2E, where they reflect on their own biases. And I found it really interesting because a lot of our students um, are predominantly white English speaking uh, teacher candidates and um, many of them will sort of learn a language that will start to sound very similar in terms of reflecting on their own biases and we'll check that box and say, okay, we're meeting TESOL 2E. But then I noticed that some of our candidates who um, had bilingual backgrounds themselves, um, you know, almost be, you know, there wasn't a standard response for how to answer that and they sort of remained silent. So I'm thinking how do we move beyond, you know, checking that box, getting that standard response is kind of this, at least we're getting that far to helping candidates from all kinds of backgrounds come in and say, you know, actually my background is a real strength here. Um, like Sari shared about her experience and, and why I, I love the chance to um, bring Sari's work here to this webinar, um, because it's really kind of a model for me about how do, how do we change, how do we have more diversity to the kinds of responses to, to TESOL 2E beyond this sort of, you know, cookie cutter response to bring more of those voices in. Anyone has any ideas or experiences that have worked for you? I'd, I'd love to hear. Yeah, can I respond to that? Of course. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I'm really glad you brought that, Laura, I think, right? I'm glad you brought that up. Um, this idea that lang the way we talk about, um, the way we talk about um, so-called difficult knowledge or concepts, um, the language that people use becomes a foil for actually engaging in, in paradigm shift and engaging in um, internal disentanglement from um, the ways that we've been socialized into, um, into um, existing and really damaging and dangerous power dynamics, right? So um, we can think about finding that if, if our teacher candidate's primary goal become, goals becomes, um, if our teacher candidate's primary goal becomes to t sound the, the right way when they're talking about um, complex sociopolitical issues. Um, and when they're talking about questions of bias, internalized bias, systems bias, um, and, um, and policies that really harm and marginalize and erase multilingualism, um, then that becomes the course objectives, 
right? And so oftentimes what happens is our courses, we have these course objectives that um, may say that our goal is for our teacher candidates to um, come into consciousness around different topics, but what they end up developing a skill set around is how to talk in a way that, that they sound safe um, and then they aren't actually given space to really truly grapple. And one of the things that I want to add to what, what you just brought up, Laura, is that so much of the work in teacher preparation is really, really centered and focused on how do we do things that help our white teacher candidates? How do we do things that um, will move and shift our white English dominant um, teacher candidates um, so that they become more fully formed, um, humanizing educators and people who are conscious of their biases. Um, and what I would like to really push us to do is to think about how do we create those spaces for our multilingual teacher candidates of color, our black, indigenous, and otherwise identifying um, people of color teacher candidates. Um, because, uh, and I didn't, I didn't have time to share this um, example, um, but when we create spaces where the goal is not, can you tell me what you know, but instead, can you show me that you are struggling? Um, can you show me that you are engaging with something that you have to wrestle with? Um, that it, it moves the space in our teacher preparation programs so that our, our, our multilingual teacher candidates of color who oftentimes are not given the same energies and attentions for growing and changing and, and shifting their own paradigms. It also creates a space that centers the possibilities for their own work to disentangle um, these internal socializing mechanisms. So when, um, you know, one of the examples I have from, from this research that I did um, with um, Daniela, um, she came into the program talking about, you know, proper Spanish, good Spanish that was really about indigenous erasure. And she would talk about um, people in her own family who spoke bad Spanish and how she really wanted to make sure her daughter, spoke, who was becoming a heritage learner of Spanish in the United States, um, was learning good Spanish and she said he, she might as well not even talk to her dad because he speaks such bad Spanish but the bad Spanish he was speaking was Chinanteco Spanish and it's indigenous languages connect combined with Spanish and um, and throughout the course of the program um, by by creating threshold concept environments where we talk about how um, how um, schools and languages of empire, so Spanish, English, and French in the United States and North and Central and South America, um, how they are arms of empire expansion and how everybody is, is touched by and shaped by them. She then was, was given the opportunity to not be consumed by narratives of whiteness um, and white domination and English dominance and was able to shift her direction into the ways that um, Spanish um, ideologies were, were, were shaping her own teaching and how she could disentangle herself from those. Um, um, and so I, I would urge us to think about that question in terms of how we create the environment itself in the classroom that's, that's around these larger concepts, these threshold concepts, so that there are multiple entry points for our teacher candidates, depending on where they're coming in from. Great. Thank you for that, Jenna. Uh, we have a few more minutes here. Does anyone have final thoughts? or final questions for our panelists? Yes, can I just make a contribution to- Of course. The second question about the international schools. I want to use Nigeria as an example. Many of the international schools are situated in the cities and students attending these schools are from the middle and upper classes. So one recommendation I could make is if the curriculum designers can actually introduce the local language as a, as a language to be taught in school, as a subject, because you'd be surprised that most of the learners are monolingual, monolingual using English only. They were born in the city, they've never been to their villages, or even when they do, they don't speak the local language. So to actually meet their local needs, one way would be to introduce the local language in the curriculum. I mean, it's just something I want to share with you because um, maybe most of the examples you are using here are US-based or Canada, but I want you to see how this can be, you know, how we can view this beyond 
the Western world. Yeah. Thanks so much for sharing that perspective, Okan. Does anyone have anything else to add to our discussion? Okay, I think we have a couple of announcements. Anastasia, would you like to share them if no oh. one else has last thoughts? Sure, all right, uh, can you hear me? Okay, good. Yeah. All right, so I've shared some links in the chat with all of you. If you don't know, uh, TESOL is having its uh, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Reading Club. There, again, the link is in the chat. It just started. Uh, we're starting off with articles from the curated uh, TESOL. Um, it was a curated combined TESOL Quarterly TESOL Language Journal regarding uh, diversity, equity, race, anti-racism. And so um, please make sure that if you're interested, please click on that link. In addition, uh, the Diverse Equity and Inclusion Task Force uh, just sent out a survey. I just got mine yesterday. And you have until September 21st to um, respond if you are a TESOL member. Please fill out the survey. It's going to be very helpful. And this group has done a lot uh, since October. Finally, there is a Supporting English learners with exceptional needs course and that link is also there i believe you have until yes save 10 percent through august 15th uh, so if you have any questions uh there and i do believe i just saw and also uh we have an upcoming my tsa lounge live uh, okan who is here in the audience today is going to be presenting on august 27th at 12 30 eastern time and I think, I don't want to put Deborah Healy on the spot, but I saw that she was on here. Deborah, did you have anything else to add to the announcements? Basically just to encourage people to join in on the um, reading club. And please, if you're a TESOL member, please fill out the diversity, equity, and inclusion survey. Your voice yeah. is so needed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Deborah, very much. And uh, I also put a link to TESOL membership if you are interested in learning more about membership. There are various tiers of membership from global to student to professional to retired. So please check that out and um, message the lounge or TESOL if you have any questions on that. And all right, I did not have a chance to collect all of the presenter emails and uh, information to stay connected. My apologies. So all panelists, if you can just go ahead and put in the chat your contact information. Uh, everybody can also save the chat if they click those three dots. So if you all put your uh, information to stay in contact, uh, that would be great. If you're interested in uh, following up with any of the amazing uh, work that we heard today. And just to reiterate that this was the academic session that was not presented in Denver, but was presented here on Zoom between the social responsibility interest section, the teacher education interest section, and the applied linguistics intersection. And so those are three of the intersections within TESOL and the contact information for, or the links rather, for those three intersections are in the chat as well. If you'd like to continue talking about these themes in I, any of those three groups on my TESOL. Um, so thank you so much for attending this webinar today. It's been great. Um, I see that there's one really one question in the chat, but we are at 4.30 and out of time. So if you have any uh, thoughts that are still lingering or any questions that you'd like to have, uh, the emails of the panelists are in that chat box there. So please feel free to reach out directly if you still have things on your mind. And thank you so much for joining us today. Take care, everyone. Thank you, everyone.